A Happy Bureaucracy by M. P. Fitzgerald Narrated by Gary Bennett Author's Note Strewn between drug use, groin malice, and cursing on a level tantamount to sacrilege are gratuitous mentions of bureaucracy. These bureaucratic references may not be for the weak of heart. Chapter 18 You can share your vulnerabilities with someone. You can share a sweaty act with them, then lie naked and together. You can share this body and somehow walk away from it pleased and happy. But when all you have eaten is pre-war spam and instant mashed potatoes for days? Well, that function you need to do alone. The drive for the past couple of days had been uneventful. No dust storms, no land pirates, no trouble. Only the open road and the comfort of each other's eccentricities. The first day had disappeared behind them as quickly as the road, and the mountain and its inferno had become no more than a whiff of ash in the air. The second day was monotonous, and it felt like they were the last people on the planet as they drove for hours and hours, witnessing no other signs of life. Given the deathscape of ruin around them, this may not have been far off. Arthur knew that uneventful did not mean safe, but this kind of conclusion was all too easy to come to. That was not to say that they had not taken precautions, though. Robbie had kept her weapons at the ready, and Arthur had kept the book strapped to his back, just like the emaciated man, to make sure it did not leave their sight. The abandoned and ruined concrete citadels that were once home to corporate empires rested empty and in view. They were just outside the deceased city's limits, and consequently outside the IRS borders. Home was near. They only had to push a little bit further. Soon they would be in the safe confines of the bunker. Soon they could deliver their bounty and set the monolithic gears of the last tax house into motion. Once this gargantuan beast had momentum behind it, an institution of slavery would crumble. Victory was so very near. Arthur had to poop, and he had to do it out of view. Reluctantly, Robbie parked the shark, and Arthur got out in a hurry. They were near an old strip mall, now stripped of its purpose. Rubble and decay had left most of this American staple in ruin, but the sturdy bank, the nearest building to the shark, stood intact. Where are you going? Robbie asked as Arthur marched to the bank's doors, its shattered glass no longer a barrier. Inside to find a toilet, he said meekly. Just go out here. Where you can see me? I won't look, she said. Arthur considered this not at all. I've been going outside for days, Arthur reasoned. I would like to use a toilet. So fucking what, G-Man? I've been going outside my entire life, Robbie yelled. Bowels in pain, Arthur ran inside. His movements were quick, but not natural. His legs were stiff, and the book on his back forced him to arc forward. His one-shoed foot came with a slight hobble. The interior of the bank was thick with dust from a generation's worth of no use. It caked off when touched, leaving a dryness in Arthur's throat and a layer on his shoeless foot. There were surprisingly few fully clothed skeletons, the remains of the pre-war civilians that had died here. Few clues were left to suggest the scavenging that had occurred. Paper money had been scattered about from the open safe, likely left after the scavengers realized it could no longer feed them. Arthur flew past the teller's counter and headed to the back. He found a small break room and an even smaller bathroom. Out of instinct and a bashfulness that was borderline neurotic, Arthur shut the bathroom door behind him to hide his deed. He heard Rabia honk the shark's horn and rolled his eyes at her impatience. He flushed. The water went down, but it did not refill. He removed the toilet paper from its steel holding, knowing it was worth three times its weight in coffee back at the IRS bunker. Toilet paper and feminine hygiene products were like gold in the apocalypse. Before leaving the bathroom, he caught himself in the mirror. His carefully parted hair was tangled, almost matted. His white shirt gray from dirt and soot and blood caked to his skin. He smiled. You did it, he said aloud. 
you survived the suicide mission. Feeling much better having cleared himself out, he opened the bathroom door and walked out with a spring in his step. But then he saw a pair of boots with decayed jaws on the toes, something that once resembled pants webbed out from a codpiece, and a white three-piece suit and a hate symbol not quite hidden by a grotesque, tumorous waddle. A scornful and frightened Robbie Duke stood in front of the colonel, her own shotgun digging into her back. The colonel's sausage-like finger was on the trigger. Behind him stood the emaciated man, a chain and collar keeping him close. He kept no doll. How about you just mosey on over to your boyfriend over there, and I decide which one of you comes out alive, and which one of you dies with my cock in their mouth? The colonel pushed Robbie forward with the red shotgun. Try it and you leave without it, you Nazi douche nozzle, Robbie said under her breath. She walked towards Arthur and stopped beside him. He was depressed to find that he could not see any one of the half dozen or so weapons she normally kept on her person. The colonel pointed the shotgun at Arthur. That book looks good on you, boy, he said. How about we keep it on you and you become my new table? The eyes of the emaciated man grew at this, but he remained silent. The colonel then pointed the shotgun at Rabia. Or how about you, missy? I'm sure you can improve my men's morale issues they've been having with those two pairs of lips of yours. Rabia said nothing. When neither of the agents volunteered their opinions on their new job prospects, the colonel licked his sausage of a finger and caressed his festering waddle. This was it the end of the line. Arthur had pushed his luck too far. The time he had borrowed now needed to be paid back with interest. I know why that book is so important to me, the colonel said. But why exactly is it so important to the IRS? It's just bookkeeping. Nothing inside of there is going to give them the numbers of my men before they decide to raid. The colonel blinked, then threw the muzzle of the shotgun wildly towards Arthur. That was not rhetorical. Why is my book so important that you burnt down a third of my business for it? Bookkeeping, Arthur replied, fighting down the raw terror in his voice. Bookkeeping is the most important thing to the IRS. We don't want to raid you. We want you to pay back taxes. You're the first establishment that the Internal Revenue Service has come across that has bothered to keep track of their sales. With it, the first proper audit since the war began. Stop the horseshit, boy, the colonel said. Call it what it is. You plan on using it to raid me. We don't raid, Arthur yelled, surprising even Rabia. We don't raid. It's called taxes, and it's a good thing, goddammit. The colonel relaxed his finger on the trigger. You know what? I'll bite. We've been on the road just as long as you, and my table over there ain't exactly the most entertaining man in the world. You convince me why your raiding is good, and I'll let you both go. There was that terrible thing again, hope. The colonel wet his fingers, had another quick round on his waddle, and then pointed his nubby finger at Arthur. Of course, if you don't, then you can choose which one of you dies on your knees, pleasing me. Rabia bared her teeth and bit the air, then nodded at Arthur. You have a deal there, Tumor Dick, she said, nudging Arthur forward. It looked at last as if everything fell on Arthur. It was up to him to save the day. They were fucked. It's not stealing, Arthur began. You pay a portion of your earnings to the government to keep it working. And why should I do that? The colonel queried. Because it is your duty as a patriot, as a- Bullshit, the colonel interjected. I have a duty to myself and my business, so taking money from me keeps it out of the pockets of my men. No, that's bullshit, Arthur yelled, forgetting he was the one with the shotgun being pointed at. You own slaves. Who exactly do you pay? Further, never in the history of ever has someone at the top shared their wealth unless they were made to. The colonel shifted his weight. Hold up, he said. I ignore the fact that there was no government to pay these taxes to. 
I gave you the benefit of the doubt in your argument, so you can do the same for me. Okay, said Arthur, I'll give you that. There being no government is a problem. He fought the urge to rant about how the other agencies of the federal government dropping the ball was not the IRS's fault or problem, but let it go. I can give you other reasons. Go on, said the colonel. Why should I pay taxes? Because it pays for things that benefit you and your neighbor. Like what? Like education that can better the workforce and enlighten the next generation. Like health care that can be used to take care of your... Arthur thought hard for an alternative to waddle. Like your affliction. It can help pay for art and infrastructure, things that no business or person could build on their own. Or bombs. Taxes is what paid for all this, the colonel said, motioning toward the ruin that was around them. More than anything else, taxes paid for the bombs that we dropped and got dropped on us. But it doesn't have to, Arthur said, desperation scratching at his voice. We can be better than that. Taxes are the cornerstone of a civilized world. We don't have to build bombs. We don't have to kill each other or enslave each other or worry about where our next meal will come from. We can all, each and every one of us, decide that the random cruelty we inflict on one another is akin to self-wounding. We can band together, make each other's lives better and pitch in with our wealth, knowing that it is an investment and a betterment of humanity. We can object to selfishness and personal wealth and instead give a portion of what we don't need to others. And we do this because it is right. Knees trembling, Arthur was holding back tears. The world had gone mad, and no one seemed to care. If he could convince just one man, a leader of cruel men doing cruel things, that there were better things to strive for than their own needs, maybe there could be a change. Maybe it would all be worth it. Now why in the hell would I go and do something like that? Did you just try and appeal to a man's moral center who kidnaps people, sells them as slaves, and just threatened to rape you before I killed you? Well, uh, I mean, Arthur stuttered. Uh, well, when you put it that way, I suppose it was not a good argument. <laughs> no shit, boy. Now, which one of you is going to die today? No hope now. Slavery might be worse than death but Arthur could not bear to send Robbie to the grave. It was possible that she could fight her way out of slavery. Arthur was prepared to do the valiant thing and choose himself to die. He began to step forward. I'll tell him, Robbie yelled, pointing at the emaciated man. I'll tell the goddamn colonel what you have been hiding from him, you goddamn swine bastard. No, the emaciated man screamed back. Why would you do that? She's mine. He can't know. I'll do it. I'll tell him what depravity you have been hiding, you goddamn animal. Shut up, the emaciated man protested, rushing forward to silence Robbia. Murder was in his eyes. He was surprisingly fast for what little muscle was left hanging off of his bones. But his movement brought his leash taut, and his momentum jerked the colonel forward, forcing him to lose his balance. Robbia kicked the emaciated man in the face, sending him flying in another direction. This destroyed what little balance the colonel still had, and he fell to one knee, pinning the shotgun to the floor with his hand to steady himself. Robbie burst forward and leaped at the colonel, stomping down on the hand over the shotgun, and like a rabid wolf, sank her teeth deep into his waddle. The cry of pain from the colonel was animalistic. As blood spilt onto Robbie's face, she cupped the colonel's balls and squeezed them like lemons. The colonel opened his mouth as if he needed to scream again, but no howl came. She backed off quickly, then eyed Arthur and yelled, Run, G-Man! Run, you bastard! The colonel lay on the ground, clutching his genitalia as he squirmed like a fish above water. The emaciated man fumbled to his feet and rushed towards Robbie and Arthur as they fled, but clotheslined himself back to the floor once his leash was taut. The book on Arthur's back made running hard, but he pounded the ground as much as physics would allow, not taking a moment to look back. Their fleeing caused dust to be kicked up into their mouths, and Arthur thought that if death had a taste, that was it. Soon they were out of the bank and into the wastes once more. Arthur jetted towards the shark, but Robbie yanked on his arm, pulling him in another direction. 
He has the keys, she said. The guns too. Run like the bastard you are. The emaciated man flew out of the bank without the colonel tugging at the leash. His chain ran down his neck and bounced on the ground as he fled towards his targets. The emaciated man was fast for his condition. He scrambled quickly and closed the distance between them. Wait! Take me with you! He shouted. Robbia stomped over and kicked him in the jaw again, sending him to the ground in a cloud of dust. What did you do that for? Arthur berated, helping the skinny bastard up. Robbia shrugged. Old habits. I don't want to go back, the emaciated man said, tears mixing with nose blood. I hate the colonel. Speak of the devil, said Robbia, as the colonel ran out of the bank with the red shotgun in one hand and his shattered balls in the other. Letting go of his wounded jewels, the colonel fired the gun. He hit nothing, but his message was clear. Robbia, Arthur, and the emaciated man ran and turned a corner around the bank. The colonel hobbled like he had a tunnel vision of thirsty revenge. He was much closer than Arthur was prepared for. The smell of dust and mildew-like aroma of dried bone marrow wafted upwards with each alarmed step. The grayness around them, caused from the years of decay of industrial construction, never meant for color in the first place. Reflected light from the sun almost blindingly, as if the dust were newly fallen snow. The sound of pounding feet echoed off of the walls of the abandoned city, sounding like a cacophony of out-of-sync drums. This went on for a full city block. The roar of motorcycles rang against the walls of the ruined buildings. The colonel's sled dogs were now on the prowl. If the colonel didn't catch up with them, the motorcycles would. Arthur's legs burned with lactic acid, and his back tightened from the abuse of the giant book slamming into it with each step. He really wished he had both shoes. It looked to Arthur like Robbia was gritting her teeth as she ran. The emaciated man looked mostly just confused. The colonel sprinted after them, not relenting for a moment. The crunching of gravel and the low but powerful hum of engines grew closer. All signs pointed to doom, except for one. Spray painted on a large particle board in the middle of the road about 30 yards away was a picture of a badge, a badge surrounding a scale and a solitary key, the official seal of the IRS. Behind that sign was the official border of the IRS, and with it the safety that came with well-trained, ever-vigilant snipers. The finish line was well-marked, and the fanfare for those racing to it would erupt in gunfire. They just had to get there. One shoe, a giant heavy book, spent adrenaline, chased by motorcycles. Yeah, they got this. Arthur dared to look behind him and urged that he could no longer fight. The motorcycles had turned the corner, and now, with nothing attached to them or chaining them together, the riders moved at a killing speed. The colonel was smiling. Robbia picked up speed and raced toward the particle board. Arthur did his best to keep up, but was not nearly the athlete she was, despite her constant smoking. Twenty yards away, the sound of engines was excruciating. Ten yards. Arthur unfastened his employee badge from his shirt pocket and held it above his head. As they flew past the particle board, the motorcycles overtook them, then slowed down and crossed in front, boxing them in. I am an IRS agent, auditor number 24, Arthur T. McDowell, requesting assistance, Arthur shouted as the colonel's hands brushed his back. The crack of gunfire rang out with thunderous authority. The emaciated man's knee exploded in a mist of blood, and he fell to the ground, screaming. The IRS border snipers. Your taxpayer money hard at work. No, 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 not him. He's cool, Arthur yelled at the hidden snipers. I think, maybe. Did we decide that yet? He asked a stunned Rabia, who responded with a shrug. The colonel stopped in his tracks as another crack of thunder rang into the air and chunks of pavement exploded up from a shot landing near his feet. His eyes spelt fury, his body sweaty, blood trickling down his horrendous waddle. The tyrant took a step backward. Yeah, that's the one, Arthur yelled. The electronic crackle of a loudspeaker conquered the air. You are within IRS borders. Assaulting a federal agent of the United States Department of Treasury is a felony and will be dealt with immediately. Drop your weapon. 
the colonel dropped the shotgun and slowly stepped away. The motorcycles parted and retreated behind the colonel. The emaciated man screamed in agony. Rabia gave the colonel the bird with a wide, blood-stained smile. Listen here, boy, said the colonel. I'm not paying no taxes, and if you come back to my place of business, you better believe that my primary client will be angry. He instinctively touched his waddle, but winced in pain when he drew his chubby fingers down the hole Robbie had made. And my client is a son of a bitch like you have never seen. Get the fuck off of my lawn, you grotesque chimp fucking bastard, Robbie said, as another warning shot was fired at the colonel's feet. The colonel had been bested. The chase was over. But this? This was not walking away with your tail between your legs. This was going home to prepare for a bigger fight. The colonel would no doubt have his revenge. He was patient and not nearly dumb enough to try and cross the border to have it now. The colonel stumbled backward, then swung his heavy body over the motorcycle closest to him. Robbie gave them the double bird. She looked over at Arthur with a wicked smile. He dropped his badge and joined her, bringing both of his hands up to join the vulgar gesture party. Watching a hateful bastard saunter off in defeat and not being the better man to him? This was victory. The colonel held on to the rider in front of him, and the motorcycles jerked forward before turning around. The slavers were leaving. Arthur was going home. About the Author M.P. Fitzgerald is an author and humorist dedicated to injecting the feverish gonzo style into fiction. You can get Memos from the Wasteland, which is the official prequel to this book, free. It contains hilariously bleak office drama, Robbie's diary, and Arthur's last letter from his father. To get your copy, just head over to his website at mpfitzgerald.art. You'll also get free updates on future audiobooks and more. We hope you have enjoyed A Happy Bureaucracy by M.P. Fitzgerald, narrated by Gary Bennett. Text copyright 2019 by M.P. Fitzgerald. Production copyright 2021 by M.P. Fitzgerald. Music by Dust Mice, available on all streaming services and dustmice.bandcamp.com. You're listening to Uncanny Robot. Machine written stories read by a human. The banging on my front door woke me around midnight. I took a deep breath, put my trigger finger on the nucleotic phaser's shred button, and opened the door. Asteroid Army? The one and only. What brings you to my neck of the universe? Mumi, we've got a problem. It's the Mushy Blooms. They need our help. Help us? But we don't need any help. It was an insane ride. First, we went around and around in circles, and then poof. Mysterioid kid orchids, hiding, sleeping, sunflowers crocheted with human fingers. Whoops, wrong universe. Several moments of that and zapparoo. We popped out on the other side, the alternate Earth. Hey, where's the sky? Mumi, it's good to see you again. It's good to be seen. Rosemary marched over and said, we're being exterminated by an alien race. And they're called the Stinky Lollies. What the hell is that? Is this safe? <laughs> of course it isn't. Don't be a baby. Follow me! Run to the shelter! Oh my god, they have blaster cannons. The music keeps us safe from their evil stench! If you've ever seen a blast canter, you'd never forget. How will we escape this certain death? Help us! Help us! What the fuck is going on? You look like you belong in outer space! Ah!